Welcome to another dope, crazy, savage, and smoking sick episode of What Happened, the show where we chronicle the catastrophes, document the disasters, and recount the regrettables. And if we're talking regrets, there's a few companies that have made more decisions that would be better off just not happening than Capcom. Therefore, this week's subject is going to take the combined might of two brightly colored bone-based mascots to hack and slash their way through it. So without further ado, let's get crazy. I'm Matt and Muscles, and I'm going to tell you what happened. Hey, Matt, please allow me to interject here and fill your dark soul with light. Oh, it's Derek from Stop Skeletons From Fighting. Hey, that's me. I'm Derek. It's me, Derek. I figured it was about time I invaded one of your videos for a change, huh? And besides, this story is more than just a story of one game, it is the story of a legendary video game company and their struggle with the relevancy between two sides of the planet. And it's a story that my partner Grace and I have researched a little bit about. So allow me to be the Virgil to your Dante, Matt old buddy. So let's talk about what happened to DMC Devil May Cry. Fuck you! Ah, Capcom, remember the mid-aughts where Capcom, I, I mean Cap God, could do no wrong? Yeah, they had an absolutely uh, flawless record. No, I didn't mean those games, I meant like like Dead Rising and, and stuff like that. There, Yeah, there, there were some bad ones too. But it wasn't entirely their fault. This point in time was the middle of a hard decade for Japan-based developers and publishers. The Japanese markets were shifting, and games with a, I guess, Japanese flavor stopped making sense as the years went on. For example, in 2002, it was estimated that half of all video games sold were bought by the Japanese, but by 2010, when DMC was officially announced, the Japanese people only bought 10% of all games sold. Uh, for instance, you know Street Fighter 4? Yeah, that was a mega hit, right? Well, in 2008, the first console edition of Street Fighter 4 sold about 200,000 copies in Japan and about 2.3 million overseas. The times, they were a-changin', and this is where our story begins proper with the release of Devil May Cry 4 in 2008. Devil May Cry 4 represented Capcom's first big return to a classic IP in a while. Building off the critical and commercial success of Devil May Cry 3, Dante's Awakening, the series had already been brought back from the brink after the mess that was Devil May Cry 2, Capcom was very optimistic for the sales potential of the franchise. And they really had every reason to be. The God of War series showed no signs of stopping and proved there was a global appeal to character action games. Not only that, it would be the series' first time on HD consoles. That's right, we said consoles. This was the first time the demon killing stylings of Dante would see release on non Sony machines, adding the Xbox 360 and PC to the mix at launch. HD development, as many companies found out, saw a dramatic increase in costs and development time. All those fancy over the top cutscenes weren't cheap. So when it was all said and done, 2008's Devil May Cry 4 sold a total of 3 million copies worldwide, which ain't a number to kick out of bed, but wasn't dramatically better than the last game. You see, Dante's Awakening topped out at around 2.3 million units. Though, wait, no, th things weren't adding up at all. DMC4 was available on three different formats, which should have resulted in a way better style rating. What, just an A? Ah, Capcom was hoping for a triple S. So it's not like DMC4 was a flop or something. Wait, did Capcom think DMC4 was a flop or something? It's kind of hard to say, but yeah, kinda. I mean, when it comes to the whole saga of DMC Devil May Cry and reboots in general, the first thing publishers should do is properly read the room. So what is the thought process here? Well, most would say, hmm, maybe that's just the upper limit of how many people are actually into DMC because... Wrong, says Capcom. The problem is that people are just tired with the current style of Devil May Cry. No, no, we're not. We're, we're not. We're right, because game reviewers are complaining about the cheesy dialogue and the silly characters. Oh, no, don't don't get rid of that. That's what gives the series its... Ah, uh, yes, and we can make the combat less complicated for newcomers. Hey, can you even hear us? Hello? Yes. This is brilliant! Oh my god! Everyone, start picking out your yachts! This is gonna be the best-selling Devil May Cry game ever! Oh wait, no, no, oh... So, what, what happened? happened? 
Devil May Cry is at its core a complicated combo-based franchise that requires high execution, has weird over-the-top storylines, and is also merciless to newcomers. So you can bet it really stung when God of War did something similar appealing to the West, but resulted with godlike sales numbers. But regardless, Capcom thought there was a problem and felt that Devil May Cry 4 should have done better commercially. And Capcom, of course, had a surefire solution. Appeal to the West! This edict, spearheaded by one KJ Inafune, whose career has been documented with stalker-like precision over at SSFF... Oh, yes, thank you, thank you, too kind, thank you. ...resulted in such other what-happened fodder like this, and that, and even more of this... Now, despite all those games being massive mistakes, Capcom producers were already acknowledging this in 2009, by the way, that there was a problem with Western versus Eastern development coalition cooperations. But there was still plenty of gas left in the tank, and Capcom had their sights turned westward and just couldn't turn the car around in time to stop all this. So, for a rebooted Devil May Cry, they decided to let some action game luminaries handle their precious IP, ones that had made some headway in the West. Kinda. Now we enter Ninja Theory. Now, while they're relatively recognized today, back in 2010, their name would elicit a hearty who? Well, their previous efforts included 2007's Heavenly Sword, a game many hardcore action game fans criticized for its somewhat simple combat and the fact it seemingly prioritized elaborate story and facial animation technology instead. Then there's their 2010 effort, Enslaved, Odyssey to the West, a game criticized for its somewhat simple combat but lauded for its elaborate facial anime. And who could forget Kung Fu Combat, a game criticized for well, this. So yeah, even though their combat chops were arguably spotty, at this point in time, there weren't many Western options who could really come to grips with the legacy of Devil May Cry's combat anyway. Rumors, however, of a DMC reboot began circulating in 2010, with the May issue of Game Informer even stating Ninja Theory was involved. This really couldn't have been timed any worse if they tried. By this point, Capcom's big western campaign was pretty busy being a massive embarrassment. Both Bionic Commando and Spyborgs sold dismally the previous year, and Dark Void, released earlier in 2010, was hot on its heels to sell even worse. Not to mention, the original Devil May Cry creator Hideki Kamiya and his new studio Platinum Games at this point had proven themselves to the public with the incredible Bayonetta. So, by the time this Game Informer report hit, Capcom fans were already starting to push back against the inevitable. DMC was basically doomed, at least from a PR standpoint, before it even had a chance to prove itself. So, again, in a read the room style moment, we're not sure what Capcom was expecting when they officially unveiled the debut trailer for DMC Devil May Cry at that September's TGS to a very mixed response. And when we say mixed, we mean it was colossally one sided. First off, you have a trailer that, let's be honest here, didn't look all that good. The character models felt off. It showed zero real-time gameplay, it wasn't made by Capcom, and was yet another attempt to have a product appeal exclusively to the West, when all signs pointed to stop doing that. This made for a goopy miasma of negativity that always permeated the news whenever DMC Devil May Cry was brought up, and would be something it never fully recovered from. Oh, and one last thing, the guy that helped launch this whole Westward expansion thing and specifically was heavily involved in DMC's redesign, KJ Japan is over Inafune, he said, yep, good luck putting out all my fires, peace out, and left Capcom literally a month later to start working on his own massive successes. Even if Ninja Theory were making the best playing action game ever created, and they were not, they still had to contend with fans who were very not into the tonal shift of the characters and the world. When fans thought of Dante, they thought of things like this. And the concept art, images, and designs coming out of DMC were giving them this. This, however, 
actually turned out to be Capcom's doing rather than Ninja Theory's. I can't emphasize this more, Ninja Theory were basically just journeyman developers giving Capcom what they wanted. Conceptualizing the new Dante during development saw the art team coming back with designs that closely mimicked his original look, but it was the producers at Capcom Japan, including Devil May Cry 3 and 4 director Hideaki Itsuno and Keiji Inafune, who urged Ninja Theory to explore more alternative options. So while it's easy to blame the new developer at the wheel, they were mandated by Capcom to overhaul everything in terms of art and aesthetics. But of course, the fans didn't know this at the time and were looking for any and all reasons to tear into the game. So Capcom would need to be very cautious from now on so as not to further goddammit. So here is the last and maybe the most damaging aspect of DMC's development, Tamim Antionades. He, uh, shall we say, was not remotely prepared for the backlash against DMC's new direction. Or, you know, maybe that's too generous. On Venture Beat shortly after the game's really hated reveal trailer, a question was posed. So how do you feel about the fan reaction to DMC? Tamim took a drag of his cigarette, and then without blinking and without pausing to exhale the smoke from his mouth, he said, I don't care. First off, I'm suddenly really starting to believe the rumors that the new Dante was based off of you, and second of all, you know who probably did care about their game selling to meme? Grin, Bionic, and Airtight Games. I'm just saying that catering to your fans is not always a bad thing, especially since the whole point of this reboot was that so that DMC would grow the fan base and not shrink it. But the Tamim train doesn't end here. And now it's time for what else did Tamim say? Well, oh. the essence of Devil May Cry is all about cool. It's about Dante being cool, making you feel cool when you're playing it. And so the combat and the style system and everything is integral to that. But you know, what was cool 12 years ago? I think that was when the first game came out isn't cool anymore. Anyway, Tamim goes on to say, If Dante, dressed as he was, walked into any bar outside of Tokyo, he'd get laughed out. While the core of these statements have some merit, this is not what you should say to convince Capcom fans that their franchise is safe. And when you think of video games as a medium, it seems as long as you make great games, generally you're fine if you keep doing the same thing over and over. Okay, the next quote I want to treat you to is from a mid-2012 PS3 magazine. At this point in our story, Ninja Theory had been receiving death threats, so I can't exactly blame him for this, but it starts out good Good. Kinda. Usually the worst creative crimes are made when you're trying to make a game for someone else. Some perceived demographic that, in all likelihood, doesn't actually exist. From my point of view, there's only one way to try and make a successful game, and that's to make the game that you want to play. A game that everyone involved is proud of. Okay, uh, you know, that's fine. So from that point of view, I don't care if it sells a thousand units or two million units. Oh, oh no, Tamim. Oh, baby, no. Now, to be fair, this article was full of weirdness. Like, the interview really asked the hard-hitting questions like, What about the series history with massive tits? To which he replied, I've got nothing against big tits. I'd rather have my head resting on a pair right now. Okay, duly noted. Um, while we applaud to meme for living his Devil May Care gimmick, all of this was a risky attitude to put forward if you want, you know, your company to continue to exist. Anyway, it might not surprise you, but Tamim did less and less interviews as time went on. No, really? <laughs> yeah, I know. And that spanned a good two whole years of solid development. During that time, we actually saw subtle changes to Dante. His voice, attitude, and other visual aspects were tweaked, despite Tamim claiming he didn't care about fan feedback. My name, by the way, is Dante. But you can call me Dante the Demon Killer. Has a nice ring to it, don't you think? One of the more evident changes was Dante's body type. He went from being somewhat scrawny and emaciated in his debut, to then suddenly packing absolute beef stuff by the game's launch. So at least improvements were happening, minor as they were. Other trailers, like the one from E3 2012, seemingly put more emphasis on story and characters. And, well, story was always kind of viewed as secondary or even tertiary in the Devil May Cry universe, with action being the primary focus. Dante was just a half demon hybrid that liked killing things and being crazy. He was never much deeper than that, and he didn't really need to be. But then Capcom decided that he really needed to be. 
Now he's a misunderstood rebel who has a rough exterior, but secretly wants to find his place in the world, but needs the proper motivation to do so to fulfill his destiny and blah 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 blah. Again, this shows a disconnect between Capcom and their fan base. Dante's appeal was that he was a goofy asshole, and it's unlikely these more serious, story-focused trailers sold many new fans on the franchise because it certainly wasn't pleasing the diehards. Now, while all this was well and good theoretically to appeal to potential new fans of the series on a visual level, gameplay obviously required a redesign as well, which is a far trickier and some would say pointless endeavor. Lead combat designer Ronnie Tucker said, The goal of DMC was to make a system that allowed newcomers to create their own elaborate combos, but still offer multiple elements veterans can enjoy. However, this is like saying you want all your groceries in one bag, but don't want the bag to be heavy. The black and white of it is that high execution character action games like this are not meant to be friendly to newcomers, and designing a system around tackling this problem is basically wanting your pizza and eating it too. All these quotes about gameplay system changes were not going down well with the people who cut their teeth on things like DMC3. Okay, so now would be a good time to sum up everything so far that was working against DMC's success. A developer fans were unsure of. A very divisive art style and tone. Combat that was trying to appeal to all ages. And constantly being compared to what was seen as the real action games coming out of Platinum, so things really couldn't get any worse until they did. Ninja Theory's last game, Enslaved Odyssey to the West, exclusively ran on the Unreal 3 engine, which was, you know, pretty standard at the time. What was not standard, however, was its inability to handle 60 frames per second, because in terms of pure design, it was never initially intended to run games at such a frame rate. So the fact that Ninja Theory were using it for DMC was, um, cause for concern. Capcom knew there was no sense in hiding it, because as soon as they showed real-time gameplay, people would use their eyes. Especially longtime fans of the series who were accustomed to the silky smooth action that all the previous entries featured. But not all was lost. While 30 frames per second would be the default on consoles, if players really needed to double or triple that, they could just purchase the Steam version. Yes, with the power afforded by PCs, DMC would run at an unlocked frame rate, with 60 being very much doable. Capcom did put a lot of work into this particular PC port, but it still wasn't enough for hardcore fans who were upset that what was seen as a long-standing DMC tenant, 60 frames per second, was now locked away on a particular format. So yeah, the reaction was not exactly what Capcom was looking for. At the end of the day though, if Unreal 3 couldn't do 60 on consoles, then there wasn't much else they could do. Oh, right. Well, okay, so Unreal 3 could get to 60 on consoles, but only by NetherRealm Studios. The blowback against DMC wasn't even exclusive to this game. It also managed to splash onto other games, like PlayStation All-Star Battle Royale. Now, we're not gonna mince words, there is a lot like a lot you can say about the roster of PlayStation All-Star Battle Royale, but one of the more unfortunate choices was using DMC Dante, or Dino, or Dante, or whatever fan name you prefer, as a playable character in lieu of the classic white-haired look. You have a game that was supposed to be, at least fans thought, celebrating two decades of PlayStation titles and characters, so when the older Dante that had three exclusive Sony games under his belt was excluded, it was it was bad. It was a bad idea. It was the wrong move. This is no one paying attention here. Especially when classic Devil May Cry 3 Dante found his way into Marvel vs. Capcom in 2011. It just seemed like Capcom made a deal to advertise the upcoming game as PlayStation Not So All Stars released at the tail end of 2012, which was not too far off the January release date of DMC a mere two months later. This inclusion slash exclusion again kind of rubbed a lot of fans a lot of the wrong way when everyone's skin was already kind of raw and bloody from the previous rubdowns. Now, with all of this ill will, Tamim drive-by comments, and the fact that Capcom never truly found their footing throughout the early HD era of gaming, it would be easy to assume DMC's launch would get a D or less in terms of style, but it wound up launching to mostly positive reviews overall, and in fact, the reviews were pretty much in line with what DMC4 initially got. However, critics still found the story predictable and a little on the nose, with paper-thin characters and silly plot twists and dialogue. Fuck you, Dante! So in terms of critical reception, nothing really changed here for the better or the worse, but the commercial aspect is another story. 
Capcom's initial projections for DMC was to sell 2 million copies in its first fiscal year, which it did not do, and then later revised that to 1.2 million. Furthermore, for their sales report that year, Capcom stated a few reasons why they felt the releases were languishing behind their projections, and while they didn't name DMC directly, at least one of the explanations could be applied to the project. There was a delayed response to the expanding digital contents market and insufficient coordination between the marketing and the game development divisions in overseas markets. And finally, there was a declining quality due to excessive outsourcing. So yeah, whatever that meant. In fact, it took about five years for DMC to sell what they were initially hoping for, with Capcom reporting back in the summer of 2018 that the game finally crossed the 2.4 million unit threshold, placing it far behind the 3 million plus copies DMC 4 would achieve. The main goal of this project was to catapult the series to greater sales and notoriety. While it failed to do that, DMC at least did not become the dreaded entry that killed the franchise like say, the Bionic Commando reboot or Onimusha 4. Still, Capcom remained quiet on the character action front until they released the definitive edition for the Xbox One, PS4, and PC in 2015. This had tons of gameplay improvements that fans had been vocal about, featured 60 frames per second on all versions, had all the downloadable content and additional costumes bundled in, including that classic DLC costume that was available a few months after the launch of the vanilla version. Not a million years. Yeah, I guess that million years came uh, faster than you thought. Anyway, sometimes, you know, definitive versions are not much better than the originals, but this is not the case here. Capcom listened to a lot of feedback and made some smart changes that truly make this the best version of DMC ever. And while that's great, it does make you wonder how much better the reboot would have done if all this new content and gameplay changes had been there day one. Furthermore, from what we can tell, the two studios are still friendly, and Itsuno has even said he would have loved to make a DMC Devil May Cry 2. Fate would deal Itsuno another hand, a hand that would see longtime Devil May Cry fans rejoicing at last. At E3 2018, during Microsoft's conference, the announcement of Devil May Cry 5, the sequel to Devil May Cry 4, was made public after several months of rumors. Within seconds, people could see that this was ignoring the continuity of Ninja Theory's world with the return of Dante, Nero, a bevy of new characters, and the cheesy cheekiness the fans have come to admire about the series. This then, of course, also marks the final nail in the coffin for Ninja Theory, because much like Grin and Airtight games before them, they saw their doors close after working with Cat. What? So, huh? What? Oh, no! That's right! Ninja Theory actually survived the DMC debacle. In fact, they found great success with Hellblade, their attempt at what they called a AAA indie title, which sounded risky on paper, but their slow rollout of well-optimized ports on the PS4, PC, Xbox One, and the eventual Switch version has clearly paid dividends. This also happens to be the next directorial effort by our old friend to meme, who has seemingly chilled out in the subsequent years. So yeah, Capcom didn't die, Ninja Theory are doing well, and unlike many, many, many less fortunate IPs, Devil May Cry is still table hopping and devil triggering to this day, but it's probably safe to assume that the book on the rebooted universe is not gonna reopen anytime soon. This is a case where a misguided attempt to broaden the appeal of a series neither destroyed nor caused it to flourish, which is exceedingly rare in the video game industry. It just goes to show that Devil May Cry fans are absolutely crazy and are strong enough to endure a few bumps in the road for their favorite missile riding, pizza eating, guitar playing, motorcycle swinging series. Speaking of a few bumps in the road, however, maybe you'd like to see what difficulties Capcom had bringing over some of their other famous franchises like Mega Man or uh, Devil Kings. Ooh, yeah, do you want to hear how Devil Kings is kind of but actually not at all a spin-off of Devil May Cry? Why not check out the video in the link for How the West Was Worse Capcom Edition. And in the next little while, we're going to have a part two, an exclusive about the East vs. West changes for Street Fighter and Final Fight. Oh, Final Fight, you say? Well, I might have a few morsels of information I could contribute. You know, I had a feeling you would, Matt. Be on the lookout for that over at Stop Skeletons From Fighting. Derek, thank you so much for helping out on this episode of What Happened, and tell Grace thanks for her tireless research as well. Oh, I will. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. So, from me, Matt McMuscles, and Derek, I'm wrong about Eternal Darkness Alexander. It is not for me. Thanks for watching, everyone. Yeah, whatever. Come talk to me when you finished Ill Bleed.